session this morning. And in fact, I have the honor to introduce two speakers that actually don't need any introduction, <laughs> that are well known to, you know, to most of us. But uh, I will introduce them just in case there are any of you who may not know them formally. So Jenny Glenny is the Executive Director of Saidi, and she's actually the founding Director of Saidi. So everybody knows, does anybody not know what Saidi is? <laughs> okay, then um, you know that Saidi is the backbone organization for Siakumele, so we are very grateful for Saidi for the implementation of this great project. Alan Amory has been working in Saidi for a long time and he's currently working as a consultant and we as the coaches actually work closely with Alan. So over to you, Alan and Jim. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, Mr. Hussain. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, the presentation that we are going to uh, give to you today was part of the uh, Dream Conference in, from ATD. They invited us to give a presentation on Sipu Malela because it was our 10th year uh, in being part of uh, Sipu Malela in uh, the, the Dream. So we have modified this slightly for this audience, but I want to say thank you. Where is Charles? At the back. Thank you, Charles, for all your work and helping us with the data. Um, he is the data guru for all of us, and he helps us very much. So we want to talk about our uh, journey from uh, when we started until where we are today. So here are our esteemed American friends. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Bill. And look. So we're going to talk about um, before 2014 when we started. So that would be the to uh, see the challenges that we faced. And then we will look at the first Sifu uh, Malera group and the design and the outcomes of that and then carrying on from 22, 2020 to 2023 CO2 two, and again it's about the design and the outcomes and then in 22 we go also do the process and now we're starting with the third component. So just looking at the census in 1996, what you can see 
is that 78 percent of South Africans were African, uh, 10 percent were white, 9 percent were coloured, and 3 percent were Indian. I'm sorry to use those terms, but those are the population groups we have in South Africa. When we looked at the higher education system, this is what happened. 45% of the higher education system was white. 43% was African, and 6% coloured, and 7% Indian. So you can see what a long journey we needed to take at that particular stage. Then, as we started to move forward, this picture started to change. And so, in particular, the white group started to go down, and the uh, African group started to come back. By the time we got to 1996, what did the census say about us? Um, it said at that stage, seems a bit odd, but anyway, 71% of the country was African, and 17% um, was, um, sorry, that it, this isn't the census, this is a higher education in 2014. So, um, the University population for Africans has grown from 43 to 62 to 71%. Um, whites have grown, decreased from 45 to 25 to 70. And so dramatic changes were occurring. By 2022, look what we can see here. And this is the first time entry students of 2022. 82% of first time entry students were by this stage African. 9% white, 3% um, Indian, and 5% coloured. And believe it or not, this more or less matches our census of 2022. So we are in a situation which I'm not sure any of us would have believed all those years ago, but we have managed to have our first time entry students in South Africa matching the population. Um, when I mention this figure, uh, to an Australian meeting in the last week, last week who runs an equity um, institute largely researching in higher education. He couldn't actually believe it. Um, they are hoping to do something like this all this while later in Australia but have a very, very long way to do. So, as we have spoken many times, in a way our access um, challenge is more or less complete. And I think we can be very proud of this fact in South Africa. And one of the major reasons for this was, of course, is, of course, this fuss. So if you look at the funded students um, in 2014, they were 175,000. If you look in 2018, they're yeah, about 550,000. And if you look in 2022, there's 700,000 students supported by so that is an, an amazing contribution to equity in South Africa. Now what about gender? Well, in the census in 1996, it was already that there were more women than men, and I believe there are reasons for this, because women outlast men. <laughs> <laughs> of the university population. So if you look at 
first time entering undergraduate enrollments by Quintiles in 2023. And this is across the, in fact, six to one of our institutions in the Formula 2 didn't have the figures. Um, but if you look at huge bit variation, and a couple of institutions, and the last deputy vice chancellor spoke about this yesterday, um, looking at, and there were three institutions, um, institution six, uh, over 60% of students come from Quintiles or Quintiles 3, institution five, um, over 60% as well, institution four, um, late 50%. And then there are other changes, too. and obviously there's huge diversity. Um, so that is one, and the other way of looking at the equity map as well is looking at the first time entering undergraduate student sponsors by MISFAS. I've already shown you how that's grown enormously um, since 2014. Um, but looking here, you can see at various institutions, close on 75% of students uh, are, in, are supported by MISFAS. Um, and just to remind you, that means that the family from which the students come, the total family income is less than 350,000 rand per year. So that just gives you an idea. You try and learn from that amount of money as a family um, in South Africa. So you'll see a number of these institutions also having this very high percentage, one institution, three growing to 75% in the last year. Um, so what we really can see there is that we have made extraordinary, extraordinary um, progress as far as access to university in South Africa is concerned. Um, and now I'd like to hand over to Tato. So we're going to talk a little bit about where we started 10 years ago. And the aims of Sipo Malala, they we, we seem to be the same, but they have changed slightly. So it's important for us to think about the way in which we think that uh, institutions can benefit. And the one of them is we start off with student data and how this is integrated into the whole system. The whole idea of Sipo Malala is to always look at the data. And it's then also using that data to create South African models that uh, can use data successfully so that you can improve student outcomes. The third one was to make everyone aware and support the evidence of improving student success, uh, to create a highlight of shared vocabulary. Uh, we all have different words for meaning the same thing. And so if you go to the CFMODA website, you will see a dictionary uh, in uh, having so that we can have a talk always the same one. But we still have some words that we want to change or think about. And then, of course, uh, to include uh, people who can do research on data. So the whole component of the first one was to inculcate the use of data in the system. So this was what it looked at uh, as in the beginning. So the first was we had an advisory committee, and it uh, consisted of the important government and other components. Sadie was the backbone and managed and looked after, and it was mainly the meetings with the, with the uh, participants, the partners, and monitoring and evaluation, and the art portal, which is the thing, and of course going to dream. We also had some work streams, and these are interesting ones. It started at the second conference, and we had an uh, engagement with um, people from um, Georgia State talking about student advising and we also had in, uh, a uh, discussion about use of data. So we all know what has happened with the student advising with the Francois group now having an institute funded by 
to help us all, but also the DHEC has, <coughs> has included a new category of people in the institutions as a form of course, uh, student advisors. So there has been a very big shift from that component that starts with that. Then we have the use of data. This is an interesting one. It is still ongoing. <laughs> ongoing. And why is it ongoing? Well, if we started off, it was a collaborative event with Vitz and Sandy to help create a data warehouse. And the data warehouse was the first part we got money from DHA, or Vitz got money from DHA, to create a proposal for a student warehouse. And so, with that being uh, agreed upon, they gave another grant to uh, then do and make the warehouse. Yeah. Then along came something called copy. <coughs> or papaya. So that, that has caused a delay beyond belief and beyond sense. And this is one of the things that for me is really very silly because um, if we want to know how students progress, surely we must have the data available and not have to ask and beg for it every time. So that's the one that drives me crazy. And we hope we're going to solve this problem. Kevin, yes? Yes. <laughs> Uh, so, we, we also have lots of international and national networks. So, the, the, we, we work with, um, very closely with ACT. And of course, we have community meetings with our partners. Um, and then, these were the people that were part of the first one. And we had a coach from ACT, and I also helped with that process. So if we look about how we had thought about this, so there were the five universities and the same co -opening. Then there was the wider South African community, the national policies and strategies from the uh, governmental components and others, and then the research capacity, and finally the international expertise. We couldn't have done what we did if we didn't have such good relationships with um, all the stakeholders in the system. So after the process, we had a number of outcomes. The one was about culture. So it's a claim about the student success. So in partner institutions and nationally, how do we look at that? Evidence-based design, um, decision-making. This is an interesting one. Uh, from a very small little um, idea about giving a biographical, um, a single biographical instrument to our students, it merged into a very interesting way that that institution used to make decision making right up to the Senate and further on. And of course, it was a collaboration. Uh, when we started, people were not very really, um, wanting to collaborate, but by the end of the first thing, everybody was talking together, solving problems together, and that's where the network of simple and data came from. The data and tools, so we tried to be very systematic, use integrated uh, data, we used to use, uh, create a number of different instruments to help people think about this, and one of them is the Institutional cast Capacity Assessment Tool, which we will talk about in the next session. And of course, the funding from uh, DHEP uh, allowed anybody to um, get funding from them to become part of Seattle Millennium 2. 
And so, and this was an interesting component. I developed this dream. People learn about how people work. And we, we, when I went to dream the first time, I thought, oh, it's just going to be day to day to day. But it's not. It's all about <coughs> people and people how we work together. And then, of course, the capacity, so achieving the dream and seeing them in the conferences. And the coaching support was very important um, for us. The policies came out. There was an institutional policies aligned to student success, uh, uh, strategic goals. There was uh, quantitative indicators uh, reading in Seco Malela, and they are still in Seco Malela. Um, for the, the partners now, are going to have to all think about these things. And of course, the advising and building of student profiles, tracking students, and using data. So we, we come to the next uh, round of the um, component. Uh, so this was the second part, and here it was a more uh, centered culture for, for higher education for students, and about reduce the, the race and gender equity differences, which is still play, uh, playing in the system. We improved the capacity to collect and use student data to improve student success and it then to expand the evidence-based components. <coughs> so again, data is a very important component. So we're going to look at this. The, the design is very similar, but there are only a few little differences. We added work streams in the, so the, the, in here, the work streams were uh, a way of getting people to think about them. So I think you've already seen some of the, the, the outcome of it because there was an FYE uh, work stream which has now come to, coming to fruition. Um, and um, the networks were the, the same, but we also now started to have a network um, Seven networks across the whole countries, not organized by SETI, but organized by institutions. And anybody could join that um, component. So if the partners and the participants uh, come to the convening meetings, every, any university could come to the regional components. And of course, we continued with the convening. We had uh, seven partners, one associate, and nine uh, participants. So what is the difference between them? So the partners got funding from the person. The associates were in the first round, but wanted to be part of it, but not wanted funding. And the participants joined, and everybody has to pay an annual fee. And that can be now taken out of the government's um, budget. And here we now start off with our own coaches. Our own coaches went to America and went with them. It was a very interesting way. And we had six coaches. And one coach has uh, gone another route. And so we had five and uh, left. And they have been very uh, helpful in, help in, in supporting so let's look at this kind of system. So if we think about the way in which the, the network was thought about, is the first is the network coordination, and then the advisory board with its members, and the national network components from uh, the the, the governments and other components, and then there were the, the five sub-network coordinates. It went, it went to um, it went to five. It started off with six, and then it had all the institutions in, as part of the thing. So we we changed the way of thinking about Seattle Manila 
going to try to include everybody in this. And I think it was one of our keynote speakers, Hello, who said, well, why are we only working with the white students? <coughs> so we then thought, yes, it's true, that we need to think about this. One of the things that we have done in the second uh, is to have services, workshop services, but we want to change this slightly to be transformed well, knowing that you have to know something, then you can do something, and we want the institutions ultimately to transform. The services um, are going to be changing again, but let's just think about it. So at the moment, we are being supporting students, having data for student success and transforming institutions. And here's an example of knowing, doing, transforming with some of the workshops that we have been uh, are managing. These workshops are not created by us, but they are being created by the partners and, and some participants. So it's, and we are going to change this in the, the last so the outcomes again importance of student success formal commitment of student success university plans evidence based decision making it's very similar and a very uh, vibrant participant partner community and regional communities and so it was very interesting to see how people gravitate to each other to help each other and I think that's something very new in South African uh, higher education. Data and tools, this is the very important component. So it was to identify and support students during the COVID. Uh, data used to identify gateway uh, courses. I, th I think we should think about what is the gateway courses. These are the courses that have many students and they mostly all fail. And the question is why? Well, there are many answers to that one, I think. Uh, the service workshops were very important and they were very important uh, ways of thinking about it. And then the data systems uh, became much more complicated and very sophisticated. The capacity, again, models for workshops uh, uh, were over 66 workshops that we did and we want to think about how we might want to change this for reputation. We want the work streams coming in and organizing and exploring common institutional concerns and development responses. The virtual dream conference during COVID was very, very wonderful from ATD because they made a special effort for us virtually, and you know that it's a seven hour difference or a nine hour difference, and so they worked and gave us uh, some very important uh, support during this time. And of course there were six university leaders with, that uh, supported AFT and the coaches for the 12 universities, and so it became a very, they developed a humoristic transfer and design process for the coaching. Again, the policies, we brought in the student voice, and I think we have seen quite a lot of student voice in our conferences. We uh, integrated the partner universities of, uh, and supported their practices, and then we, the maturity of several of the services were um, evident.
the students don't stay in the system, they can't pass. So I think South Africa has actually made huge progress in this. If we look at our national retention rate, undergraduates, are, this is just looking at the three-year diploma, three-year degree, and four-year program, which really makes up the, the kind of core of the undergraduate um, offerings. So you can see how um, this has moved over these three years, at least eight years, from 2014 to 2022. Where in 2022, one can see that the three-year programs are now sitting with a retention rates of this. Um, in 2018, um, sorry, in 2022, of some 92%. The four-year degree programs similarly and the diplomas have actually now increased um, to
to improve greatly. And so the next set of figures we've got here is minimum time plus two. So yesterday, um, the DDG of higher education made an alarming statement about what Treasury was thinking. The Treasury says that we lose two thirds of students in the higher education system. It is simply not true. And I think we need to, all of us, come together. I was talking to Professor Peterson yesterday about coming together to see whether we can assist the Department of Higher Education and Training <laughs> to make a case for treasure to treasure because it is alarming that those kinds of statements can actually be made. So once you look at in, um, minimum time plus two, you really can see some pretty good throughput. So that's 50%, and the lowest one is unfortunately male, um, and that's sitting just about 50%, and all of the others are some of them getting as high as 70%. Um, so that figure of two thirds being dropped and lost to the system um, is not something that we should allow to be And I also want to say that I sit in many, um, I go to various seminars, and again, people who should know a whole lot better who are um, in the system as professors, uh, as heads of divisions, also make the same kind of mistake about how big the dropout rate is in universities in South Africa. So this has changed dramatically, and I think we need to get the message out there as much as possible. And so graduates there are from African group, so here. And then if you just write by here, you can see that huge increase is of African graduates in our country. So we are making huge progress as far as that is concerned. Uh, again, a matter of some concern is um, this figure here is that the females are going up extraordinarily. And the male number, if you look at the size of that and the size of that, it's pretty much the same. So although the system is growing, there are more men in the system, uh, the number of graduates amongst men is lower than, um, is not, it has not increased in any way. So I think what this shows us is that although we can really be proud of, when, of what we've done in Seattle Malala, um, and the community that we've created, the collaborations that um, are evident in this group, we still have a lot of work to be done. And what we haven't yet looked at in any serious way are the figures around um, the kind of gainful employment that uh, graduates have. And how serious is this um, issue of graduate unemployment? What last year Murray Lebron showed us was certainly for those students who graduate, um, graduation is a huge, um, uh, provides a huge uh, capacity for upward mobility. That, that much is really very clear. Um, but whether or not we have a huge um, number of, of graduates who remain unemployed after two years or so, um, that is an issue that I think we all need to be taking very seriously in the next phase of the Thank you. Here we are starting a new process, a new way of thinking. And um, there are some changes, and I'm going to just put all the numbers up so we can just talk about some of them. The, the advisory committee has been enlarged, and one of the interesting things that this class is not part of that, and it's the also the um, private um, <coughs> providers. Department of Bursaries. Yes. We provide a, a wraparound support. We have many more uh, work streams that are uh, part of the uh, system and some of them are more mature than others. And the idea of the work streams and um, people who know things to create a uh, understanding of something across the institution that then results in a work 
shock that we are not going to call the net workshops anymore. We're going to call evidence-based practices for student success. And we have previously had, as we said, spoke before about students, about data, about in, uh, the institution, and we've added teaching and learning into this mix. So we have a whole process that we have developed to help people create short learning courses that will be also uh, aligned to the doing, knowing, and transforming. And so this is the, the very important change that is going to happen from uh, the network. Of course, this is still going to be done in collaboration with all our 20 partners. Uh, we don't do anything um, on our own. I don't think we will succeed if we do it on our own. It's about the network. The network is the most important part for everything. So uh, we can't have convening meetings as we had before. So we're going to have uh, a process where we're going to solve problems together during meetings. We will have one face-to-face -face and one virtual. And of course, there are 20 partners which we would like to uh, again say. So give everyone a <laughs> to say thank you for having 20 uh, component partners in this and getting money. And then our coaches are going to do the same kind of thing they have been doing for anybody who wishes to have a coach. But we're going to add another dimension to it. I, yesterday there was a, a, a heated debate about spending your grant money. Well, please use your data, your, your coaches, to help you do and spend your money. So that's one of the things that the coaches are going to be doing. So the aims are very similar as what we were before. It's again looking at all the, the, the components, but the one that we want to really emphasize is the student voice. So we had a student voice that went to ATD right in the beginning of our uh, program this year. We are going to have a process in Sierra from all institutions to identify excellent students that will become the people who talk to us as students as we do it in uh, IM homes. So we look forward to that difference as well. So, again, I just want to talk about the knowing, the doing, and the transforming. The most important part in this process is transforming the, the institution. It's not going to work if we don't change the way people think about things. And student success is the way to do. If we think about all the students in the country, if we just have 1% increase, how many more people will be in, uh, the, uh, into, will be brought into the economic system? So we, the, we, will, we don't want to call them workshops anymore, we're going to call them short learning courses, and they will be more interactive and evidence-based, they will have a structured learning pathway, and they will also be uh, engaging and shareable resources. Everything will be done online so that anybody can take that workshop, be part of it, and then take it home and use it in your own institution. And so it will be there, we hope, for a long time. And of course, we wish people will change things. So one of the things here is the examples of the evidence-based practices. Just thinking about supplementary instruction, uh, we know that there are two parts of it and nothing is going to change, but maybe we can add a third one that changes the institution a little bit more. 
so these are just examples of how we might uh, have a evidence-based practices. And our coaches, so okay, our coaches, we need to acknowledge what they have done. So they have created a component which is about being a critical friend to you, a connector, a co-creator, a developer, a facilitator, and a motivator. And you can use all those components with the coaches. And then, of course, the coaches will help you with the data. They will help you with the UCBG to solve the problems and engage with student success. New partners. We will have an induction phase. Everybody who has been part is part of it. So it will be creating a student success committee and your coaches will help you with that. We have a Know Your Data and Ethics workshops, well, they will be turned into short learning courses. We will give you an, uh, some uh, ways of managing ICAT, and that's what we, we will be talking in the next session. And of course, we need to have in, uh, leadership buy-in, and I think we have seen the leadership buy-in here very well, so thank you for the leaders. Suppose 
where the institution there has only 3,000 students. And you have this ideal situation where you have a thousand first year students, a thousand second year students, a thousand third year students. And it's so ideal that all the first years move to the second year, you replace by another person, and so on. Then you check, again, assuming this ideal situation of a thousand graduating after say three years is a three year degree. So the formula goes you take the thousand and you divide by the total number of students, which is three thousand. So the most you can actually get from this formula is a third. <laughs> because you take a thousand to divide by the, the three thousand and then that's the point of the future. Yes. Oh, you, you can only graduate a, a maximum of a third, so you are losing two thirds. But it's the formula that is not what we understand. So we do need what is called mathematics. <laughs> A conceptual understanding of any formula because if you go, if you look at it there out of context, you think that there is too low. But the third in this case is
movement uh, is getting to be greater and greater. So there is a, a huge amount of data available from DHET which shows you um, the dropout and the graduation and the throughput rates of students and all the way back in the middle of uh, about 20 years. Um, and the increase between N and N plus 1 is getting to us too. The problem is, uh, is that there are only so many places in higher education. So the longer a student stays in the system, is actually keeping another student out of the system. And we already know that our system um, is hugely oversubscribed. Uh, the higher education university system, particularly because the TVEC system um, is not as functional, as we say, as it, as it ought to be. So I think that is the kind of compromise that has been reached at the moment. Uh, and I think what we as institutions need to be doing is ensuring maybe we won't always achieve N, but N plus 1 should be what we really aim at because that um, satisfies both the student and helps um, to keep more students coming into the system. Yes, a, a very brief one. We run out of time. Uh, thank you very much. The step that is being up on is you often hear about how bad the situation is, but the improvement over the last uh, 10 years is substantial. But I want to respond to two matters. One is the issue, I think it's my, the, the worst interpretation of the concept, lack of conceptual clarity on how numbers work and how you analyze the data and what the implications are. It's highlighted for me the work for us in SIA, especially with us being data, data driven and, and the importance of us, um, you know, um, analyzing the data but also interpreting that data and making that interpretation public um, is very important. So I think that's a great. Um, so the focus data that needs to be uh, exemplified. And then, you know, I'm, I'm always passionate about this N plus one notion. And for me, uh, closing that gap between the N plus one and N plus two and reducing that um, dropout is about being deliberate about the N plus one. And I'm going to go back to my passion to say that the potential of the extended curriculum program with additional year, but with deliberate, intentional, structured um, provision for students, will, it, it will be part of the system and it will be able to um, increase that N plus 1 and reduce that gap between N plus 1 and N plus 2. So I think it is something worth um, almost having some dedicated uh, energies in the work. Yes. Okay, um, I'm going to give you a chance, very briefly. Thank you very much. I, I just want to say that what's concerning for me is and, and the, the VCs and DVCs, Charles needs to help me. In red, the presentation yesterday said that the grants is a paid contribution to. The grants is a paid top slicing of the block grant. It is not some gift we are given. It is money that was being fixed to address success. So I think we have to, we, we, the, the statistics, I'm not going to even say what went through my head yesterday. But I think we need to make it very clear and I want to propose this for, for Siak Malela. And, and if our Press colleagues that are here can help us. We have to have a marketing campaign to get the right statistics out and the right perceptions because I'm very concerned that words are being changed to change what the historic facts are. Eunice Barron stood up, I don't know how many years ago, and he said in other university systems, top size grants don't exist. This money just goes to university. I think the grants and the influencing has been 
very, very strategic and visionary uh, decision by our department. Right? I support them there. But you don't make it now as if, as if it's some contribution or gift you're getting. Right? I think that's very important. And uh, to all the young people here, welcome to the struggle. <laughs> I really have to, I really have to stop um, Professor Stadium, thank you very much.